In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. For more than 20 years, God has used Bill and Annabelle Gillum to help people understand and appropriate the truths of Galatians 2.20. Through their tapes, books, seminars, and nationwide radio program, thousands of people have found freedom and fulfillment as they have learned how to let Christ live in and through them. Now just imagine allowing God himself to express his life through you in your family, your work, and everywhere you go. Join Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum and discover why Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, gang, thanks for coming out tonight. And um, so take your brother and sister by the hand and we'll trust the Lord together. <clears throat> the only one who can teach us is going to teach us, and that's him through us, right? So here we go. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for what you have accomplished for us. And uh, we do want our lives to be lived on planet Earth. To um, We want to live in such a way as to bring respect to your reputation. You call it honor to your name or glory to your name. And we really do want to live that way. Is that right, gang? Right. So, mm -hmm. sir, show us how to do that. We don't want to, quote, take your name in vain. That's what you really mean is drag your name through the mud by the way we live. God, we don't want to do that. So we trust you now, sir. There's one aspect of our lives, particularly our emotions, that can really be used to knock us for a loop. So, Lord, I pray that you will show us how to deal with our emotions tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, a friend of mine named Chuck Solomon taught me uh, this story about a bear up in Alaska, and he uh, spent about five minutes teaching it to me. And uh, I took that basic story, and uh, just God just began to reveal all kinds of things to me about it. And I have established a hierarchy of steps or stages that we go through uh, as a result of this story. So it's designed to help us understand our emotions and how to deal with them. So let's say that uh, you are up in Alaska visiting <clears throat> and there's a man-eating bear who lives up there. <clears throat> he's eight feet tall, he weighs uh, 800 pounds, we'll say. And he's mean as a junkyard dog. And uh, he ate your friend about a month ago <laughs> and all he left of him was his uh, rodeo buckle that he won at the state fair, you know. <laughs> He's mean, man. Now, <clears throat> he has just spotted your earth suit as you're out there walking on the prairie, and um, he's galloping full blast toward you, and you are about to be invited out to lunch. <laughs> and um, According to the size of your earth suit, you're either about to become a meal or an hors d'oeuvre to, to him. <laughs> now then, your mind and your emotions have been lazily watching the screen in your uh, brain here and observing the Alaskan landscape when all of a sudden this salivating bear comes, you know, galloping into your visual screen. Now then, mind is going to have to respond first and mind is going to trigger off a data retrieval system and bring up out of the memory banks all data relevant to bears in this situation. Now you've got stuff in your memory banks about bears that you're not going to retrieve, like bears hibernate in winter. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think you don't even know that. <clears throat> relevant stuff, right? Bears eat meat. <laughs> I are meat. <laughs> and you're going to begin to generate options. I could climb that tree. No good. He does that. He'd eat me in the tree. <clears throat> I could run. No good. Bears can now sprint a horse. He'd catch me on the fly and eat me. However, I could be running while I generate more options. Right? <laughs> 
And then you look over there and you see a little cabin and you say, I could run into that cabin. Now, all of these ideas are generated by mind. Now, then feeler's getting in on the action over here. Now, feeler is a tremendous motivator to will. And feeler then slams into will with a level 10, you know, I feel like if we don't hook it on, I don't need to worry about making any decisions. So will being thus highly motivated commands brain to direct muscles to propel earth suit into cabin. Now then, <laughs> this cabin, you dash into this cabin. Now, it is built like Fort Knox, man. It's made out of railroad ties, bolted down. Even the top, is the roof is railroad ties. But you don't know that. It's got vines growing all over the outside of it. And you run in there and you slam the door, which is made out of bridge timbers, three inches thick, cured oak. You drop a huge wooden bar into a cradle behind that door, and you instantly become safe in that cabin. But you don't know it. It's dark in there. You're a stranger. You're not used to this environment. One little bitty window in the front without any glass in it. And the split second that you get that bar dropped into that cradle, that bear slams his head into that door and just kind of addles him. His old eyeballs are just spinning around. And when he kind of comes around, why, he puts his big old head up there to that window. He can just get one eye to the window at a time. His head's so big. And he sees you in there, and you're kind of like the kernel of a nut. And, and you are in this big husk and he's going to try to pluck you out of there and eat you. And he just goes ballistic because you've gotten away from him. And so he reaches his big old arm in there, you know, to try to get you. And so if I'm a fly on the wall watching you, you're going to be plastered to the back wall of this cabin awaiting your doom, right? Now, you're safe in the cabin. Uh, there's no way he's going to get you. You could lie down on the floor and relax. You could catch up on your daily Bible readings. <laughs> you could order a pizza and let him eat the domino boy. Right? <laughs> you are safe, man, but you don't know it. So do you see that you could die of heart failure and be safe at the same time, right? You know, they say what you don't know won't hurt you. Listen, in Christianity, what you don't know will destroy you. My people are destroyed for lack of what? Yeah. Knowledge, right? All right, so we're going to start establishing a hierarchy of steps here now. So we'll label the first hierarchy truth. Number one, step number one, truth. You are safe in the cabin. Now, the critical factor in my little story is the passage of time. So as the clock ticks, you're finally going to arrive at step number two. <clears throat> you're going to look, you know, your eyes are going to adjust to the dimness in there, and you're going to see that bear futilely trying to get into this cabin, trying to tear his way through that window, and he's just not making any headway at all. And you're going to come <coughs> to this conclusion. You're going to say to yourself, hey, I believe I'm safe in this cabin. Now, what is that? That's faith. Now, it's not Christian faith. It's cabin faith. Now, faith always has to have an object. And in this case, the object <coughs> of your faith is the cabin. And you use, you use this kind of faith all the time. It's not Christianity. It's just plain vanilla the way humans operate, right? And so, <coughs> you believe that you're safe. But, your belief in your mind is about a two. Whereas feeler is still sending you signals at level 10, I feel like that bear is going to get in here and eat me alive. It's just any split second he's going to break through. And that's a 10. So feeler is giving you signals five times stronger than faith is. And so will is going to choose to go with feeler instead of with faith. Now I want to ask you a question. Could will... Just say, rain on you, feeler, and go with faith. Could Will do that? Of course. Even if both faith and feeler were crying out to the opposite, Will could still choose 
to go with what God says, right? That's why Jesus said even a mustard seed of faith is all you need. Now, gang, <clears throat> you don't need more faith. This is one of the big deceptions in Christianity. <coughs> Some well-meaning person will say, well, if you had enough faith, well, this wouldn't happen. Let's say you, you walked into church and you sat down on the pew and it collapsed with you. And some guy who's been watching too much TV says, uh, well, I say there, brother, uh, if you had enough faith, that pew wouldn't have fallen with you. <laughs> now, that's not true. You had plenty of faith. Your problem wasn't with your lack of faith. It was with the object of your faith. The pew wasn't worthy of your faith, and you just shouldn't have sat down in it. But your faith was okay, all right? Now then, <clears throat> so if I'm a fly on the wall and I'm watching you at step, at step number two, you're still going to be plastered to the wall, and here's what you're going to be doing. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you for this, for this cabin. Thank, oh, thank you for this cabin. Thank you, God. You know, as he makes a lunge at you, the bear makes a lunge at you. Look at you. You could still die of heart failure with your faith, right? What good is your faith doing you? None. This is what God talks about when he says faith without works is zippo. It's dead. You might as well not even have it. It's not doing you any good at all. You have got to bring your actions online if it's ever going to do you any good. So we arrive at step three, which is the King James Bible calls it works, which is simply behavior or action. All right? And so you have a little talk with yourself, and you say to yourself, now this is crazy. My knees are all locked up. My mouth's dry, my palms are sweaty, my heart's palpitating. I'm going to have some kind of an attack here if I don't get my act together. So you say, get off that wall, boy, and sit down on the floor and relax. Now shake it out and unclench your teeth, man, and get your tongue off the top of your mouth. Let it sag down in there, see? Breathe slowly, deeply. Close your eyes. Don't watch that bear. Plug up your ears. Put your mind on something peaceful, like fishing with Gillum, where you just sit in a boat all day and nothing ever happens. You just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are you doing? You are attempting to live like a safe man lives, aren't you? You're trying to act safe, because you are. You're attempting to line up your behavior on the truth by faith. And gang, we're not even talking about Christianity. We're talking about cabins and bears. You do this all the time. You live like this. You see what I'm saying? Now, as you force yourself to relax on that floor, finally, feeler is going to get into the act. That's step number four. I finally begin to feel safer, sort of. <laughs> when I was designing this thing, putting it together, I, I first wrote it out, I finally feel safe. And then there was a checking. And I said, ah, I see what you're saying. I'm going to imply that a human can get total control of his feeler, and that's not true. Now, how do I know that? I don't know it from my studies in psych. I know it from the Bible. I try to get everything I'm sharing with you guys from the Word of God, not from my background and my doctoral program at Oklahoma State University. And I don't mean to be critical of them, all right? But we got to go to God's Word, gang. <clears throat> so how are we going to know that you can't control your feeler? Because we're going to look at Jesus. Now, you can influence your feeler, but you cannot get total control of your feeler. Look at Jesus the night before the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Word says that his earth suit was sweating great drops of blood, right? What was his feeler doing on a 1 to 10 if his earth suit was sweating blood? 14, right? Now, Hebrews says, you have not struggled against sin even to the shedding of blood. 
That's not talking about Calvary, folks. That's the night before. His struggle wasn't at Calvary. He'd already settled the issue the night before. That's where the struggle was for the Lord Jesus. See that? So let's say that I see him out there sweating blood, and I'm out there with him, and I say, <laughs> I go out there, uh, Mark, and I say, oh, sir, excuse me, but uh, I see you're in great agony out here, and, and uh, you've always told us, you know, that you give us great peace. You, know, you give us this peace that passes understanding. You say, my peace I give unto you. And it looks like to me that you've lost it. And, um, and Al, I believe that he would say, oh, no, Bill, I, I've got great peace. But, Bill, the peace that passes human understanding is not necessarily a feeling. In fact, most of the time it's not a feeling, Bill. It's a knowing. It's knowing my Father has everything under control. It's knowing that. And he's going to take this situation and work it for good to conform me to the image of Christ. That's for me, right? Now, Bill, he'd say, <clears throat> there are a lot of folks who claim that they've got great peace of mind, <clears throat> but it's just because they feel good. Their circumstances are good. The kids are behaving. You know, they've got the car paid off. Everything is rolling for them. And so they feel so good about it all that they put their mind on how good they feel, and they tell you that they've got great peace of mind. But, Bill, they really don't. They've got peace of feel. Now, you let, the, you let the car get totaled, and the kids go off the deep end, and all kinds of bad things happen on the job, lose a sale, Duncan. And all these kinds of things. <laughs> and, and their feeler will kiss 10, and they put their mind on how bad they feel, and they tell you that they've lost their peace of mind. But Bill, they never had peace of mind in the first place. It's peace of feel all the way. Bill, true peace of mind is knowing something, that our Father has everything under control. And he's for us. And he's working his plan for us. And he's got these great plans for us in the future. And he's conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. I can live with that. Can you? Yes. I can live with that. And Annabelle and I don't come to you out of a vacuum. We've been through hell, man. We got all kinds of stuff that's in our background that we haven't shared with you guys that have been really tough licks that have been thrown at us on this planet. But through it all, our Father's been faithful. Amen. All right, now, let's take this one, th two, three, four hierarchy and move it over into the realm of the spiritual and make the same applications over there. So step number one, the <coughs> truth. Well, we've been talking in our Bible study about your true identity in Christ and letting Christ live his life through you. So we're talking Romans, Galatians, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians. All of Paul's writings are loaded with these teachings, okay? Now then, <clears throat> over here in the bear story, you were safe. The guy was safe in the cabin, and he died of a heart attack because he didn't know that he was safe, right? Over here in the spiritual applications, there are going to be a thousand Christians who die today and go to heaven never having a clue about their identity in Christ or how to let Christ live through them on planet Earth. And folks, these verses will do you no earthly good once you get to heaven. These are not heaven verses. They're earth verses. They're, for, they're Monday morning stuff. This is for us now so we can have victory over our own, the tyranny of our own flesh. Okay, so... Let's move on then to step number two. Have you got enough faith? Well, let's, let's test you and see if you do. How many of you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? I mean, you believe the ribbon and the maps and the whole thing. How, how many of you guys believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Let's see your hand bone. Well, great. You just passed. You got enough faith. You say, yes, sir, Bill, I believe all these verses here about who we are in Christ and everything. I don't understand them, and I don't think you do either after hearing you teach, but, but, I, but I believe it. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, now that's wonderful. But over here in the bear story, this, this old boy believed he was safe in the cabin too, right? But he still died of heart failure because he didn't bring his behavior online with his faith, right? Now, I've counseled people, some of them even pastors, and they'll come in and they'll give me what they call their problem. In counseling, they call it presenting problem, right? This is my problem, Bill, and I'm sitting here with a hidden agenda, and I'm real kind to them and all that compassionate listening, and it's real real, but I've got this hidden agenda, and that is I know that this dude is really, he's not telling me about his problem, he's telling me about his symptom. His real problem is he doesn't know who he is in Christ and how to let Christ handle it for him. He, he doesn't know that, see? So I, I said, yes, sir, that's right, you know, and we talk and talk and we cry together and whatever. And then finally, I begin to share with him the solution to the true problem that he's got. And some of these guys say, oh, I know that. Why, well, Galatians 2.20, you know, you taught the Sunday school class on that. Yeah, I know that. You know, the wonderful old truths of our identity in Christ. I learned that in junior high school. Yeah, but now, Bill, back to my problem. This old boy doesn't any more know that than a hog wears a side saddle. <laughs> All he's got is information. Information. Watchman Nee made this powerful statement. Our Chinese, well, he's a, our brother that wore a Chinese earth suit. He's with the Lord now. And we can tell the Lord, Lord, tell Watchman that we're using his example. Give him a hug for us. Okay, so Watchman Nee says, all knowledge is the outgrowth of obedience. Everything else is just information. Now that is powerful. All knowledge is the outgrowth or the result of obedience. You got to fish or cut bait, man. You got to get with the program if, you're, if your information is going to be converted into knowledge or it'll do you no good whatever. People, there are Christians, there are so many tapes floating around and everything. We got information up to our ears, right? We got to bring it online. We got to act it out if we're ever going to hope to see it begin to work and become knowledge, move from our head to our heart, as the guy says, okay? So, <clears throat> step three then is works. Now, over here in the their story, the guy began to live like a safe man lives. He was bringing his behavior into line on the truth by faith. Now, you and I have got to do exactly the same thing with these truths of our identity in Christ. I have got to live like it's true for me. I've got to act like Christ is expressing his life through me and rain on how I feel. If feeler lines up, praise God, that's a fringe benefit. If it doesn't, rain on it. Keep right on going. See, look, feeler is not your main barometer of reality. God's Word is. Is that right? We let something control us that can't even think. <laughs> that's not too smart, is it? Our stuck feeler. Okay, so the way God taught this to me uh, the uh, How to Let Christ Live Through Me, I uh, had gotten my new doctor's degree at Oklahoma State, and I'm on my way to be a new psychology professor. Hot dog. Dr. Gillum. I was so proud I smelled. <laughs> and so uh, I'm on my way to my new job, and my attitude, I'm a deeply committed Christian, and my attitude is, now, Lord, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to be a good professor. And that's a good goal because i got to have credibility. But my main goal, bro, is to win people to Christ, win these kids to Christ, right? But i got to establish credibility, right? So, <clears throat> Lord, I'm going down there, and I'm going to win these kids to Christ. And God, you'll have to admit, you don't have many saved psychology professors. So, uh, I mean, you know, this is really kind of a special case here. And God is up there talking to Michael or one of those guys, and he says, now, there he goes, bless his heart. He, He's on his way down there to help me. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't realize I'm not that hard up. 
<laughs> I don't really need that boy helping me. I could raise up stones to do that if I wanted to. But um, the boy means well. He's got a good heart. And, um, but, but he doesn't understand that my strength shows up best in weak folks. And Bill's problem is he's, he's just too strong, especially now that he's got his new doctor's degree. <laughs> so I'm just going to have to let him get a little weak. I'm going to have to let the devil uh, bring a little Romans 8.28 into his life, a little all things. <laughs> all things work together for good, you know. Okay, so <clears throat> he's going to let a little all things come into my life. So here I am. I'm teaching my new psychology classes. I mean, this is abnormal psychology. There's 60 kids out here. And I'm, I've got me a new tweed sport coat, just like a real professor does. You know, I, I really look the part. And I am well prepared. I'm ready. I'm going to ace this thing. And right in the middle of my lecture, Al, my notes grow cold. This is supernatural stuff, Tommy. I mean, God let the devil do this to me. And I'm binding the devil and claiming the blood. It, it's about as effective as screen doors on a submarine. It, it, you know. <laughs> I mean, no help, man. I'm calling, God, help. And it's like one of these machines, you know, <clears throat> if you wish to leave a message, uh, you may start speaking at the tone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my face turned red as a beet. Boy, when I get embarrassed, Everybody in the place knows it. I turn beet red, and I'm silent. I'm agonizing. God, help, you know, and nothing. And these kids are beginning to get, you know, you know how it is when you're, when you're in a room like that. I mean, they're crossing their legs, and, you know, they're squirming in their seats. You know, Delbert Dumb up here has lost it. Uh, I'm demonstrating abnormal psychology to my, <laughs> my class. I'm, I'm uh, case study A. <laughs> so I finally stagger through this lecture. I go to my office, shut the door, lock it, and say, oh, God, God, help. You know, how am I going to ever do this for you? You know, if I'm Delbert Dumb, you know, what in the world? You know, God, you've got to help me. And he's out to lunch, man. He's off to Mars for a winter vacation or something. <laughs> you know, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> well, anyway, that's the way it went. And it, was, it wasn't always like that, but it would be like they'd ask me a question that I couldn't answer, Pat. It'd be like, what's Sigmund's last name again? You know, Freud. And, and, and I, I couldn't say, you know, well, I'll look it up and tell you Wednesday. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Or, or when's your birthday? One of those real toughies, you know. That, and I'd just turn red as a beet, go through the whole routine all over again. I was dying. I was dying. I, wouldn't, I didn't tell Annabelle. I was so humiliated. I was thinking, I have spent all this money getting my degree and all this time, and I cannot hack it, Mark. I'm going to get fired. I am going to have... I, it was awful. So somehow, a tract came into my possession. I don't know where it came from. It came from the Lord, obviously. Talking about Galatians 2.20, that I've been crucified with Christ, and Christ wants to express his life through me. I didn't understand it. It was all King James English, and I never have understood that very well. And so I read this tract onto an audio tape, and I drive around in my car and play that, my own voice, over over, over, over. And finally, I understand, just to peek through the keyhole, enough, I got down on my knees in my bedroom, and I said, okay, sir, I think I see what you're saying. You want to teach my classes through me. You want to use my knowledge of psychology, my earth suit, my oaky accent, only it's going to, the monkey's going to be on your back. You want to carry the burden for me. Okay, that's what I want. And I gritted my teeth, and boy, I mean, I prayed a ring-dinger prayer. I give up. Now, I did a very critical thing. I 
brought my behavior into line with the truth by faith. I got up off the floor and put one foot in front of the other and walked and got on my bike, I'm a bike rider, rode up to the school and went in believing that Christ was living through me and began to deliver my lecture. And gang, it worked. And it kept on working. Now, there were times when there would be a testing time that would happen. And I knew, I recognized it, I knew, uh-oh, I'm going to blank out again. But I acted right in the situation. I very quickly said, and this is all microsecond stuff now, gang, okay? I very quickly said, okay, Lord, it looks bad for the home team. But now, you're on the, you're on the hook here now. You're the one who's doing it. I'm giving it my best shot, but I'm believing my, by faith that you're doing it through me. And so if I turn beet red, that's your problem, not mine. I'm going to get fired, that's your problem, not mine. And so I just kept shoving the responsibility onto him. Now listen to me, don't hear me saying I was sloppy in my preparation. I gave it my best shot, but I believe by faith that there was the life of Christ being lived out through me with an oaky accent in those classrooms. And he pulled me through, Anna. He pulled me through. Now, bro, when it began to work there, sister, when it began to work there, then I began to apply it to my relationship with this sweet thing. I let Christ live through me to get off her back. And then I began to understand how to let Christ live through me to get off of my kids' cases. And began to understand how to let Christ establish a sweetness, a fragrant aroma through my life beginning in my own home. And finally, step four, finally, I began to feel more like it was true in me, sort of. In other words, you can never let your feeler be your main criterion of whether you're walking in the Spirit or not. It's your faith by the Word of God, as you line up on the Word of God. That's your criterion about whether you're walking in the Spirit. Now, gang, <clears throat> we've been talking about these things for quite some time now. And you can believe everything that we've talked about, and you can have it validated to you by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And you can walk right out of here and live your life just like you always have done, and you be in control. You can do that. Do you no good whatever? Or you can sell out right here and now. You can have a prayer time and just sell out and hold a good funeral right here in this room and claim all this stuff by faith and then get up and put one foot in front of the other one believing that Christ is now expressing his life through you to do His will on planet Earth. Have you ever stopped to ponder what we're actually doing when we walk by how we feel, when we allow our emotions to control us? We are allowing a part of us to control us that does not even have the capacity to think. Our emotions do not have the capacity to make decisions. We must walk by faith, and faith is rooted in the mind. Hey, our emotions can be going at a roaring ten in one direction, but we don't have to go along with them. My emotions may be feeling, I am such an inferior person, I am so unloved. But hey, wait, check with mine, check where faith is. Is that a true statement? Is that what the Spirit says? No, no. Faith says to us, I'm altogether lovely, and I have Christ living in me to meet today, to perform for me. My emotions may be screaming, I cannot endure this another single moment. Is that true? Check with faith, check with mind. The function of the mind is to delve into faith, into what the Spirit says. And the Spirit says, I have Christ living in me. 
and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, we must walk by faith. We must walk by who we are in Christ Jesus, totally loved, totally accepted, totally forgiven, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of our new identity.